9. As much as they both would like to stay in their little world till they run out of blood, they have things they must get done. After they wake up and detach from each other, they put their shirts back on and walk out of their hidey hole. He listens to make sure nothing is happening on the other side. Zook hears nothing on the other side, but a happy dog near the entrance to their secret fort. Bite is excited to see them both, feeling better about Pat. Zook asks Steve why, he acted the way he did the day before, and he answers that Bite didn't like the way she smelled, and he would get used to her. She wonders why he wasn't comfortable since she did shower off the night before. Perhaps there is a smell you can't just wash off. When they make it to the ground floor, Bite walks up closer to her hand and sniffs her a little bit. His head perks up a little bit more, not so uncomfortable close to her and he rakes his head against her open hand. Patricia has to call in to work, and try to play things off, perhaps she has been, too sick, to call in recently. She is lucky that the law firm isn't busy enough to be needed daily. She is also lucky that her boss is a man, and quantifying the time off as, women's issues, instead of what it is, would work better. She could deal with that soon tonight. Zook wants to keep Patricia in a safe place until they can figure out the attacker, and while she gets used to being her new self. He also needs to get Detective Cooper off of his back. He hasn't given the cops a treat in a little while, he figures it is about that time. He should check in with the legal hacker at the precinct as well, he calls him, the Fonz, because he looks so much like him, other than he is a little thicker around the middle, like most computer hackers might be, his name is Gables. He tells Bud to get ready to get going, Steve is going to stay in the house with Patricia, and the pets, to make sure nothing happens. Zook tells Patricia to call in, still needing some time off, and they would deal with the issue soon. He lets Patricia know that she would be needing to meet with their boss within a few days. She is eccentric, but will likely be understanding of her situation. Once he gets into the job mindset, he realizes something he never went over with her. They both sit down in the living room of the small house, and discuss something else. He needs to know, whether she has seen the attacking vampire before. She tells him that she didn't remember seeing him before, but he tells her he can help her remember. They have spent the night before discussing many things looking into each other's eyes or taking comfort in the other's existence. He jumps right into the deep end of the swimming pool, getting right to the point, and not soothing her in the least. He begins by asking her mind directly if she remembers seeing this man ever before. Minds aren't books, they are onions, and she feels his expertise in peeling her layers of protection and free will from her protected center. All of the social normality of filtering her thoughts through her mind then out of her mouth slips away. Her mind races back without her direction, which it has never been before. This night is different, when he looks into her eyes, and talks to her, she feels like he is seeing her not just topless as he did the night before, but naked. Her mind is an open tapestry to him, and she is much more nervous than she was in their secret bunker. She is much more shy speaking to him than having her shirt off laying next to him accepting the gift of his blood. She tries to close her eyes racing back to the night of her attack, but she isn't able to under this one's gaze. The face of her attacker is etched into her brain, no matter her desire to erase it. Important things like her first kiss, the first time she is naked with a man, both of them being awkward with the other's body, a clumsy knee placement stopping the encounter cold no matter their desire, not for him, but her. These things are etched into the forefront of anyone's mind, and the changes that this man made to her life, are also in that forefront. The man in that room is not something she will forget, each sharp edge of his face, the curve of his ears, is remembered as a computer file, facial recognition safe in the, bad, folder. That file is checked through the rest of the database that is her brain. Her head darts this way more than that way, trying to place this face, 
that she doubts she has seen ever before. He finds one file, a single match she remembers, it is one from such a long while ago, she didn't remember which day, a Friday night in the law firm office. She has been there late at night, a couple of weeks before taxes are due. The firm has deferred payment yet again, looking for more tax loopholes to exploit. She has just been told by management that she needs to earn her salary, and find every tax benefit they can use to not pay the state, city, and federal tax this year, like every other year. She has seen that face walking past the door of the accounting department, through the window. It is a late night, very few people stay late at the firm, not even the janitor is walking down the halls this late at night, but someone else is, which draws her attention to the window. That face walks by, doesn't nod, say hello, or walk in, but that is the only time she sees it. It has something to do with the firm. Whoever this is, he might figure out if she calls in saying everything is okay. In this case, it would be a better strategy to keep the firm guessing instead of letting her situation be known. They can work around that when the time comes, letting management know, and giving her sick time, the initial transformation of one's body into a vampire takes a lot of effort. What scares Patricia more, is that she answers his questions truthfully without her thought filter, her mind works as though, it wants to please him as much as her body wants to. She barely knows this man other than she owes him almost everything. She hired him as a private investigator, bringing him into this mess, and he has come through with the needed books. Not only that, his blood tastes like chocolate mousse, something she loves. She has never felt so intimate with another man, she told him almost anything the night before, anything about her life, and he soaked it up like a sponge, greedy to learn about the mundane and paramount alike. The sharing of their blood, is also more potent than any other time she has had, naked naughty times, with another. Yes, not having a shirt or bra on, gets her interested in slipping her sweatpants off as well, but she takes her cues from her maker. As he offers his blood, something they both need, it is stronger than an affirmation of an urge of their once human body, but fulfilling the need of eating, drinking, getting in a sturdy workout, and getting a deep tissue massage, all at the same time and giving that same sensation to another. This urge of giving, and accepting blood, is like Christmas, and they both made something they both enjoy, over buying something they already had. She is glad he didn't ask her anything of the night before, because even with their display then, she is still very modest about what happened between them. She didn't know if it was, as precious to him. This leaves her mind though, she would have more time to discuss her interest later. He gets up, and gathers things to leave with his driver. She thinks. I'm with a man who has a driver, this is something new. He's a vampire, which is unique, but I'm one too, with another chance because of him. Is this something I want from him just because he saved me? He has a bodyguard as well, two of them. Steve punctuates her thoughts by walking up to her once Sook is done gathering things, and leaves through the side door with Bud. She is still sitting on the couch, Steve walks up, didn't sit, slightly nodded in greeting and speaks to her. Ma'am, in case you didn't catch it before, my name is Steve. I have been with Mr. Zook for nearly 40 years, and he saved my life. I have a few rules I would appreciate you following. She nods when he stops, and prompts her to answer in some manner. He continues bluntly. I am his bodyguard, he has helped me for a long time, but I am jittery from my time during the war. Please do not surprise me with light footsteps, sudden heavy footsteps, or come behind me, and tap me on the shoulder or arm. Please announce yourself if you are quiet when you enter the same room where I am located. The pets have been a blessing, especially Bite here. The dog perks up when he hears his name. Bite was brought home when I was last surprised, and almost killed. He has helped me through these trying times. I was attacked in the line of duty, and the boss gets me fixed up good, and Bite here is a good soldier, and often walks the perimeter with me. 
I will walk the perimeter multiple times, please do not stop me or distract me, it is my routine. You can walk with me if desired but speak quietly. I can speak to Bite, he tells me if he feels or smells something strange. Bite thanks you for cleaning up, his nose is sensitive, of course, and he can smell that you recently died, and it upsets him. Steve says all of this with the coldness of someone stating a simple fact, this is all so distressing to her. She asks. Can you tell him, I'm sorry about before? I didn't know he could tell. It upset me too. Which war are you meaning, where you had issues, was this like, World War I or something? Steve cracks a smile. Nah, I'm not that old, but I was deployed to Vietnam near the end of that one, close to 80 years young now. He nods and walks to another room, Bite follows him out, and she stays on the couch with her thoughts. Zook is in his car with Bud, and they drive off. The first place they need to head, the late night donut shop, coincidentally where Tina used to work. He gets a couple of dozen donuts to bring to the police officers, like he has many times before, and one special jelly donut he knows that is Gable's favorite, to add a small bit of something special to add to his influence of the police hacker. It takes some time to gain their trust, but he's been at it for a while. Cooper is pretty good at his job, but Zook is better, and needs to disrupt some investigations so that the officers wouldn't all be likely killed, and so that they could stop the nasty things happening within the city. This time though, he feels like he has been caught, and needs to handle the situation. Not long ago, he messed up and was caught in the room with Gables getting help, maybe with a little bribery, and mind manipulation thrown in. He stayed in the room with the Fonz to check on, some computer issue in a recent investigation, and as he left, Cooper was asking him questions to which Gables didn't have good answers. He has to head out that night to go after a member of an organization that wanted to take over the city, but he found out that if he didn't take care of it soon, Cooper might join the human hunters that attack vampires, and they did a pretty decent job at it. He makes his way to the precinct, and talks to the front desk crew. They allow him through to drop off the donuts for the late night crew. He walks back, gives a few donuts out, and sets most of them in the break room. Then he took one to the back office where Gables is set up for the ethical hacking he did for the department. He opens up the door without much prompting, and gives him the catchphrase that made the Fonz a star in happy days. Hey. Gables jumps out of his seat, and his legs bump up against the top of the desk. Damn it Zook, why do you have to be so cruel? The only answer he gets is a smile. Gables smiles back and retorts. Ah oh man, I can't stay mad at you, come here. He stands, walks over, and very uncharacteristically grabs him in a hug, nearly knocking the donut from Zook's hand. Zook looks around seeing no one else, pushes Gables into his office, and closes the door. He drops the treat on the desk, it is grabbed up without much question from Gables, and he starts eating it. The Fonz is one of his sources in the precinct, now that Cooper has started to be suspicious, or worse. He speaks with him to get past a little small talk, then gets to the important stuff. Hey Gables. The ethical hacker looks up with powdered sugar on his face, and jelly dripping down his lips. Have you seen Cooper around lately? Gables nods enthusiastically. Oh sure, he's been in during usual day shifts. He has come in asking me some different questions, most of them I don't know about, a little about you, some different things. I wouldn't tell him anything though, I don't know much anyways. He also did something strange, he asked me to update his home address with HR. I asked him if he could just go tell them, and he told me that he wanted to do it without HR knowing. I told him that would be breaking the law, a little, okay a lot, but then he dropped a few twenties on the desk and told me it is really important. Even HR couldn't know where he lives. I asked if it is because someone is after him, or if he is doing something illegal, and he said no. So. 
I sort of, did him the favor. The blood manipulation that is taking effect within Gables is pretty sturdy, he wouldn't divulge this sort of stuff to almost anyone, especially since he blatantly told him about the attempted and accepted bribe, but he knows that he could trust Zook, he is such a nice guy. He's also, not technically, a cop. As a vampire feeds blood to a human over time, the admiration and desire to please that vampire, overrides most of the other desires of the human. Zook fumbles with this information for a little bit, the address has been updated in HR, and he needs to try to deal with Cooper. He is a good cop, just has too much information now, and he's worried about him, figuring a few things out, if not everything by now. Zook will deal with him to keep him alive, others would deal with him to make him disappear. Zook asks. So, you updated the information in HR, but do they have some sort of backup, or past entries for his address? Do they have recent addresses so that I can find out his current address? I just need to discuss a couple of things with him. Well, why don't you just come during the day, with his new shift? Well, it is complicated. Did you update his address too, and did you take a screenshot or something of what the address used to be? It was a few days ago, maybe a week, I don't remember, and he had me change it to a P.O. box instead. He had me get rid of old addresses also, sorry I just can't remember it, not something I keep in my head. Who cares anyway? Perhaps not, but Zook knows that our minds keep everything, in some way in there, he just has to find it. With the power of his blood, he has the Fonz think back to that day. The sun is shining, they have lunch brought in from the burger place down the road, and that is a happy memory. Free lunch from the department is awesome. Remembering info from days ago isn't easy, but Gables is eager to please. He remembers the food more than anything, the place knows just how to make it, a small bit of fat for moisture, they make their pickles fresh, Try the fries twice for crispiness, and not too much salt. He remembers, that Cooper even brings it back to him, because he is on a project. Cooper closes the door behind him, and asks him if he knows a way to update the records. He says, Sure, since I'm in the network, and the security isn't so great, I can probably do it. That isn't my problem, I don't do security, I do hacking. Those jerks in that department are useless. As long as it isn't something too illegal, perhaps for a little. Incentive. He next realizes, and says it out loud. Sheesh. Am I some terrible, corrupt guy taking bribes, and stuff? Zook bites his lip, so that he wouldn't answer him truthfully. Cooper asked me that day, to update his HR records. Post office boxes aren't allowed to be used as regular addresses for them, but I know the ways to update it so they are accepted. He wanted his old addresses to be different also, not even known by HR. I tell him that I could and would do it after we ate some lunch. Man those were good burgers. He continues from that day. The lunch didn't disappoint, the burger is cooked just right to a medium rare, remember it all on my tongue, thinking back to that day. The pickles are crisp and have a briny bite, the tomato is just right, and the fries crunch just right in his mouth, leaving salt on the roof of his mouth to mix with the burger. It is so unhealthy, but I also don't care. With it sticking in his head, and since he hadn't had it since, he knows what he was having for lunch that next day, maybe even breakfast. Anyway, getting back to the task at hand, I go into the records with the detective addresses and find the needed files. After updating Cooper's record from the address to the P.O. box, it is so difficult to picture them before changing them, it isn't something that I care about. Just as the numbers are on the tip of his mind, the door to his enclosed office creaks open, and another person is walking in. This disrupts the discussion, and Gables comes out of his daze trying to remember that day. The other person walking in is a detective, neither of them know his name. He sees Zook talking to Gables in there, and says, Hey sorry to disrupt, that guy who brings the donuts came in again, 
did you get one? Gables points down to the donut, red jelly dripping down the donut, onto the napkin. Thanks for letting me know, I don't always find out in my little corner of the world, I got one. The other man closes the door without another word, not interested in meeting Zook. It is just as well, Zook is a little irritated at the disruption. Gables said it is okay, the only things he could remember were the number, and the first letter of the address, which he writes down and gives to Zook. Zook says thanks, puts the paper in his pocket, and walks out. The numbers, and first letter, would be good enough to find almost any address in the area. After a quick search, he finds an apartment building, and directs his bodyguard, and driver, to get there that next day to keep watch. If Cooper works most of the day, Zook is asleep, and they wouldn't be able to use that. They'd have to figure something out, 